The sky is overcast, the grey green swell heavy but calm as though possessing a different temperament from the choppy white flecked waves that burst forth here and there. I'm sitting alone watching, it is some time in spring I suppose, for my father is working in the garden. I stare at the surface of the sea without listening to what the reporter says and suddenly the outline of a face emerges. I don't know how long it stays there, a few seconds perhaps, but long enough for it to have a huge impact on me. The moment the face disappears I get up to find someone I can tell. My mother is on the evening shift, my brothers played football and the other children on our patch won't listen. So it has to be my dad, I think. And I hurry down the stairs, jump into shoes, thread my arms through the sleeves of my jacket, open the door and run around the house. We're not allowed to run in the garden, so just before I enter his line of vision, I slow down and start walking. Evening! It has been four days since my announcement video and I have finally read a Death in the Family by Carl Uwe Knausgaard, the first instalment, you can see it from the number one there, people, of his My Struggle series, of which I am going to read all six. I've given up my entire life to just reading Knausgaard. In regards to the series, we're going to play it a little bit differently. Knausgaard is known for being honest, for stripping everything back, to really putting himself on the line here. And I, I, and I want in these reviews for me to take a bit of a different tack, to move down that element to kind of get Knaus Guardian, if I can call it that. Now, my first thing about Knaus Guard, I've noticed that there are two groups of people when it comes to this author. They are the people think that he is great, he's phenomenal, he's a rock star of literature. Oh, by the way, if you've read the first book and you see how he was being a rock star, or you get the other people who don't like Knaus Guard. They don't like the fact that he has pretty much sold out his family, sold out his children, sold out his wife for the purpose of manufacturing art, for manufacturing literature for, for manufacturing a book. They don't like the objectification of women. They don't like the fact that he just referenced how much he wants to masturbate on pages. All of that, they're like, they ain't interested. So you have this dichotomy going on here. Now, <laughs> people, I've done some research. I mean, it's not peer reviewed and it's not gonna turn up in a Yale University seminar, but I've spoken to enough people to give you this generalization. Generally, the people who like Knausgaard have read Knausgaard. They've read his books. They've seen what Knausgaard has to offer and they like it. You know what's gonna happen when we move over to this group of people, don't we? This happens with loads of books, it happens with loads of authors. You shouldn't really be surprised at this that people just like saying these things. Generally, people who don't like Knausgaard ain't read the guy. They've not even opened a book. They've not even touched it. I don't like that. I don't like people who say, I don't like this person. And it's all like secondhand information. Ain't interested. They go, nah, secondhand information should not be the primary focus of me making up my decision on something or someone or some books or, or anything. I want to read it. I want to engage with it. And I'll make my own damn mind up if I like it or not. So, we're all adults here. And hey, you know what? If you're under 18, you don't have to be peer pressured by people to say something that you think is right. It's okay to just turn around and be like, you know, I actually don't know anything about this. I, I don't have an opinion. It's quite okay to say that. I say it quite often. Carl Uwe Knausgaard, for those who do not know, wrote My Struggle, a series comprised of six books. It's over one million words. And it has 3,000 plus pages. Almost as tall as the six foot two, three. I mean, the guy's lanky Norwegian author. It's very truthful. It's very honest. He bears all. And he, there's, there's no filter on this book. Whatever he thought during the time, he writes it, even if it feels wrong, even if it feels like morally ambiguous, even if it just feels like heartless, Knausgaard just like bears it all on the line. Before I decided to commit myself to read the entire series, I looked at some reviews and what was interesting is that firstly, people don't like Knausgaard because he's a bit of an asshole. And I'll, I'll be honest. I think Knausgaard knows that he is. Knausgaard, despite what he writes, understands that he's an arse. He says that he doesn't like a girl in his school because she can't pronounce her R's, while equally he can't pronounce his R's. It's, it's very self-aware. He knows what he's doing. 
the criticism that he's an ass is doesn't feel like a criticism when the guy knows that he is based on this book alone because i haven't read the other books by the time of this recording he hasn't misled me once the guy's completely honest in regards to what he's doing and he's fully aware on his reflections and how how idiotic something sounds when he's talking about him as a teenager versus him as an adult. He, he's fully aware. That criticism falls on his face where Klausgaard kind of meets you halfway. You can't turn around and be like, you're a bad guy, where he's like in the street going, yeah, I know. Like, I'm telling you these things. It's like meeting up in a seedy alleyway with a drug dealer and your criticism is that he sells drugs. Like, yes, everyone knows. You wouldn't want Greta Thunberg's UN speech and your criticism being that she focuses too much on climate change. You wouldn't read the foundational Welsh myths that are found in the Mabinogion and your criticism being that you struggled with the names. They're Welsh. The second criticism that made me absolutely cackle with delight every time I saw it were that people were upset with the spoiler that Knausgaard's dad died. It's called a death in the family. Like, what did, what, who were you expecting? Knausgaard's mum never makes an appearance. She's an absolute ghost. His brother's at his side all the time and his father slowly drinks his way to death and his family just let him do it. Who else was it going to be? Nevertheless, we start this book with wee little Knausgaard going out into the garden to meet his father, saying that he saw a face in the ocean. Being broadcasted and reported on the news is a disaster at sea. And everyone thinks the face that Karl Uwe Knausgaard sees is a dead body. Knausgaard said that he didn't see a dead body, didn't see a human face. Instead, he saw within the waves a face. His father, who gives very little feelings toward Knausgaard, mocks him. And later on within the book, Knausgaard's going up to bed and tells his parents, like, oh, look out for the face in the sea, like if it's being reported on the news. And Knausgaard can hear his father laughing when it doesn't happen. What book are you reading, huh? Knausgaard, Death of the Family. Huh? Knausgaard? Death of the family. Right. It's about his dad who dies. Oh, true story? Uh, yeah. All oh, right. Wonder how much he hates him. <laughs> oh, that's not good. No. It's even upset the baby. This sets the precedence for Knausgaard's relationship, not just in his familial relationships, but he is a teenager. And as we see him moving into adolescence, he wants to explore himself. He wants to explore his feelings. He wants to explore sex. But still, like his father, there is some removal of feeling. And now the Klaus God's looking back onto his life. I feel within the series, he's trying to plot out the gaps for us. He's trying to explain what was going on in his head during this time and trying to rationalise it. But not rationalise it from his older, wiser self, but from the perspective of where he was, a being a spunk-filled teenager, sometimes that's all he can think about. On top of this ad that he finds alcohol and his friends mock him, they call him Garfield because he gets so blackout drunk one time that they're watching a Garfield cartoon and Klaus just keeps shouting, I am Garfield, I am Garfield, until he just crashes there and then. He's called Garfield for a while, but he knows that he can't remember anything about that. It's all second-hand information. What's interesting about the structure of this novel is that part one deals with Knausgaard finding alcohol and enjoying alcohol. And in part two, we have Knausgaard's father living on alcohol and using alcohol as a means to survive. And his survival technique leads to his death. Taking it back to the beginning, but before where the story starts, we have these thoughts about why is a dead body so repulsive? Why is there a need to cover up the body? Is it an act of respect or is it an act of repulsion? The fact that we don't want to see the face, we don't want to understand that moment, that stillness, what had life now is absent. This first section in regards to how Knausgaard tries to tackle 
what is death and how do we react how do we engage with death really interesting stuff ricocheted right to the end where Knauskar spends the final moments with his father just staring at this face and he's not so much trying to read expression he's just trying to read the face he says as if he's trying to understand who his father is not what his father is trying to say how his father feels just who his father is it's a striking moment and within my struggle we have these beautiful moments kind of wrapped within these kind of baffling like sequences so when Kelsgaard gets the call to say that his father dies the first thing he could think of is having a wank and, and you're there going right okay um right that's what you want to tell me as the reader again you can see that the first criticism that i mentioned people are going to read into these moments what they want and i have no doubt i don't even know if this exists but there's no doubt that someone's probably going to make the case that upon real death that the reason why Knausgaard thinks about masturbation is because of Le Petit Mort, where, you know, the orgasm is the closest thing to death and that Knausgaard's trying to understand. You know, really, I don't think Knausgaard's thinking like this. I think Knausgaard is just really peeling back all sort of filter that he's got. That's basically what this book is. I don't think it's, it's trying to be, like, unashamedly... Like shocking at times. I don't think it's trying to be quirky or different or like oh look at me like I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say something that that you weren't expecting. Knauskart's just being really transparent, but it's kind of at times pulls the other way where his transparency just makes it opaque and you're just left with these statements and you're like Oh, okay. You might think that this is a sexually charged novel or masturbatory in some way, if, if you will. But remember, Knauskart is looking back when he was a teenager, when he was 16. And please have a think. I think most guys who were 16 are a little bit sexually, like, they're bisexually focused. You have to remember that Knauskart's right this for when he was a 16-year-old boy. And if there's anything I can go from, I was focused on a lot of things. And I watched some sites that I definitely learned very quickly how to clear the internet search history. And I think most boys who are in their adolescence would agree with me. I think it's quite normal for adolescence boys to be young, dumb and full of cum as a wise old man once said to me in a pub well, that was a day however what's not normal and shouldn't be normalized is men and boys sexually assaulted and harassed be that verbally or physically women that makes you a twat masturbate as much as you want god it feels really weird to say being sexually violent towards a woman is a crime masturbating as much as you want isn't what's interesting from Knauskart's perspective is that he doesn't really want to engage in dating someone or get it into a relationship. A girl rings him up and says, you want to date me, don't you? And he goes, um, uh, no, not really. And she just puts the phone down on him and ignores him. That's kind of the end of it. When Klaus Gard does end up dating, there's just this awkward teenage moment where both of them clearly understand what they've done, but don't really like each other they liked each other for that night but they don't really want to pursue anything more and are just in this fervent like are we aren't we sort of thing this awkward moment which is all part of growing up but now Scott understands that there comes a point where there's growing up and then it's just aging and seeing his father cry towards the end of part one is where I think he realises that he's not growing up. He's just aging. He's reached where he's going to be and he just has to continue living at this stage. And I think there's a really good reflection on this book as a whole. Part one, as we see Knausgaard from eight years old, growing into adulthood. Knausgaard right in as he's eight years older than the age his father died. Thinking back of now I'm my father's age, now that I have kids, 
Like, I understand why my dad was acting a certain way or why he was saying certain things or why, you know, he was doing something but I didn't think it was in my best interest, but actually it was. And like, what is fatherhood and who is a father figure? And yeah, what is fatherhood or what should a father figure be? Again, Nausgaard's mum's pretty absent from this book. His father's the person teaching Nausgaard to grow up. Oh, can I ask you a question Go while I hold this? Do you like me? What's that? Do you like me? Yeah, of course Am I, I do. okay? I don't like you, I love you. There's a difference. Is a difference? What's the difference? Huh? What's the difference? Well, I could still love you, but, still, but not like you. <laughs> yeah. What's daddy like? Huh? Sure? Sure, I'm sure. Gosh. Look at that. And in the second part, not where we grow up, where we age, this book stagnates. It is utterly boring. I know this is meant to be like the climax of his father's dead and it's him trying to deal with the death, deal with his grief, deal with like the funeral planning and the directors and how much does it cost and all the family come over, they're trying to figure out X, Y and Z. Boring. <laughs> I I didn't want to read it. I did not want to read it. It was absolutely a slog. I know people write that he's meticulous with his seeds, but now Scarred, what you have to understand is that he's not really writing a story. He's not really writing a memoir. He's really writing nothing. Like nothing happens in this book. Things happen, but nothing happens. That's kind of like a Klaus Nardian thing. It really will be up on page 481 where Klaus Gard writes this. The first time I realised what I was writing really was something. Not just me wanting to be someone or pretended to be was when I wrote a passage about Dad and started crying while I was writing. I had never done that before, never even been close. And I'm so glad, Klaus Gard, that you decided to find your heart at page 481, a little bit over to 482. Let's not get into that. That that's the end. I'm gonna be completely honest now. If the next five books are anything, like part two from my struggle, this is the worst decision I have ever made. I've renounced my decision to ever do book projects ever again, because this just <sighs> my frustration here what i think is worthwhile me mention is that the actual obvious criticisms of this book i don't really have an issue with klaus Gard's open and honest and whether you like it or not he's going to tell you sometimes they're funny sometimes they're a bit lackluster sometimes they're really profound sometimes they're just a bit boring there's a constant fluctuation that is going on in this book in regards to his asides in regards to his thoughts in regards to how he's processing these moments but actually what's going on is nothing it's like looking into the abyss you'll probably find something worthwhile you'll find something that catches your eye or you'll think you'll see something but it's just vacuous I feel as though I'm stuck in a really peculiar place because I'm not sitting with the people going, this is amazing, this is an international phenomenon. Like, I read this, it changed my life. Wow, this is incredible. The guy's doing something different. But equally, I'm not sitting over with the other people going, I, I don't like this guy. I don't, meh, 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 meh. Equally, I'm not on this side going, I don't like him. He's a really bad writer. I don't like what he's doing. Just, it's just talking about nothing. I have really nothing to say about it. For me, this is a 4 out of 10. And I gotta read 5 more bloody books that are probably all exactly the same, all a bit boring. Oh, why?